He kōna e purangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. It's Asha here. So, this episode talks in detail about the mosque attacks of March 15th, including news clips from the day. It's raw, it's real, so we wanted to give you a heads up, as this could well be upsetting for some listeners. Take care. Remember, you can always ring 1737 if you need to talk to a counsellor about anything. There is a verse in the Quran, وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ الَّذِينَ قُتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أَمْوَاتَ بَلْ أَحْيَاءٌ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ يُرْزَقُونَ And there's another verse, أَحْيَاءٌ وَلَكِنْ لَا تَشْعُرُونَ That they're not dead, the ones who were killed in the sake of Allah. They're alive. It's the stormy spring day in October 2019. Jemaya Jones and I are walking the quiet rooms of Al Nur Mosque in Christchurch. It's a place we know well. I grew up here, attending Islamic classes every week. Jemaya is the women's coordinator. But on March 15th, 2019, it became a place unrecognisable to us. I had an assignment due, so I didn't attend Friday service that day. I saw and heard the events unfold through the media and phone messages from my friends and family. But Jemaya was there. At first, it was a Friday like any other. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Muslims from across the world gather at their local mosques or in Arabic masjids. We face Mecca, pray shoulder to shoulder to our Creator, Allah. So I happened to be at the women's room, as usual, organizing the seating for all the ladies. And we were all sitting down and listening to Imam Jamal giving the sermon. And two minutes after that, we heard loud noises coming from the left side of the building. There has been a major shooting incident with reports of gunmen firing near mosques in the center of the city. So we were all confused. We all got up to find out what's happening. So most people look out the window to see what's happening. And I know from a friend that they actually saw uh, dead bodies in front of the main entrance. Just as well, nobody opened the door on the left side because the guy was right there. All the residents of Central Christchurch have been told to stay indoors. There were about 40 or 50 ladies on that day here. They all ran off like a wind through the right side, the exit door, and through the gates to the main road, and they were safe. I think the reason uh, most of them were safe were because when they left, the killer was actually inside the mosque. Six people are dead. Three people are seen to be in a critical condition, three in a serious condition, and a triage centre has now been set up outside accident and emergency at Christchurch Hospital. The balance of people who were in the mosque in this, in this particular room was about 15 people, I think. And uh, so, most of the people here, some of them were discussing with each other what to do. And a few of them decided to hide in the storeroom. I saw a few of them just sitting there on the carpet in prayers. And a few of them ran to, through this exit door on the right side into the woman's bathroom and ablution area. There is a, an extreme police presence, ex, a very significant number of police officers, who all of whom are armed. They are standing behind cars with rifles, screaming at people to get out of the way. I was confused, but I heard 111 being repeated by someone. So I quickly grabbed my handbag, and as I was going there, 
I look out on my right side, which is a fence to the neighbors. I saw lots of men climbing over, clambering over, and they were bleeding. So I confirmed in my head that it was a shootout. They said that they saw at least three people on the ground and blood everywhere. It is a panic situation here. There must be a, a number of ambulances are here. As many as 12 ambulances have been seen rushing to and from the scene. There's a TV in front of the women's area yeah. that connect, like shows you what's going on in the men's yeah. area. Did you see anything? No, because as soon as those shooting happen, suddenly nothing's happening in the screen because people were just running to the left side and the right side and the Imam was actually behind that. He was down, sitting down. You know, we, we didn't hear anything from there. All we hear is from the outside, the, the gunshot. Non-stop. Witnesses reporting seeing a man enter the mosque opposite Hagley Park dressed in a military jacket and he just started shooting, they say. Then I, I went to the women's ablution area, which was a very quiet place. I needed a quiet place to call 111. I shut the door behind me and I was talking to 111. So were you not in shock? Like, it seems like you didn't know the gravity of what was happening. Yes, I did not know the gravity, but I knew that I had to get help. And throughout this time, a lot of things was happening in my head, like I'm telling the operator, hurry up, hurry up. He's coming for us. I'm saying, I think something like, he's going to kill all the men and he's going to come for the woman. Within 10 minutes, I heard the siren outside. And soon after, I heard a banging at the door and it was the police with, in full arm. And they told me to quickly get out of here. They're, he's still here, they're still here, that's what they said. Get out of here. So I ran out to the main road. I saw a few dead bodies. And as I talk to you about it now, I'm trying to, to, to think, like, what was my feeling on that day? One word I can describe is, I felt numb. And, and at the same time, I was thinking in my head where my loved ones were. I'm Asha Abdi, and this is Widows of Shuhada, the story of four widows, Farah, Neha, Hamima, and Muhubbo. In the year following the terror attack on two mosques in Christchurch on March 15, 2019, 51 men, women and children died at the hands of a lone gunman. He walked into their place of worship, live streaming as he pulled the trigger on a semi-automatic rifle. In this episode, episode two, the women take us back to the attacks and what happened on the day when they became widows of Shuhada. Shuhada means martyrs, people, like their husbands, who are innocents killed for their beliefs. So Mahubo was here on that day, in this room. I just don't know where she was. She could have been hiding in the storeroom, she could be hiding in the woman's ablution, she could be the one who ran out with the group, or she could be just sitting here on this floor saying her prayers. i like to find out where she was. Mahoba's experience that day was very different from the other widows in this podcast, who were either overseas or at home in Christchurch when the gunman entered the mosque. Not only did Mahoba lose her husband, but she also witnessed the tragedy. What she saw that day is burnt into her memory. Seven months since the attack, Mahuba now keeps to herself a lot more. She doesn't go to her regular cooking and sewing classes. She can no longer work as a cleaner because she can't drive. I used to drive my car everywhere. I can't drive now. If I hear a slight bang, I get scared. Here, in October, 
She's basically put everything in her life on pause. I haven't seen her for seven months, but just a couple of weeks ago, we went to a, a fitness classes and I saw her a few times there and she was quite friendly and smiling. So I feel like she's sort of slowly going forward. Yeah, yeah, I've noticed that as well. She's a lot more vibrant and she mm. goes to the mosque regularly again. Mm. That's good. Okay. We meet up with Mahobo at my home while she catches up with my mum. But despite what might seem like progress, Mahobo still can't recall anything from that day. All Mahobo is able to say right now is that she was there at the mosque and that her husband died. Farah Talal, a 27-year-old Jordanian widow, remembers everything. On Friday morning, I was working, so I went for work, and my work is literally just downstairs, so I just go down because the childcare is the same location where my in-laws' house is. My colleague's phone was ringing nonstop. Her husband was calling her, and I think he was at Oakland. And I saw her face, and I'm like, okay, what's happening? And I could tell like something is wrong because she just went pale. And she's like, Farah, they're shooting in the mosque. I'm not sure what's wrong. And so I'm like, okay. So I quickly um, called my husband and he didn't reply. And I'm like, can you just please tell me you're okay? And he didn't reply. And then we weren't sure what was happening. Like we weren't sure. We didn't know how bad it was or, you know, like we didn't know. Things started to unfold quickly. Some parents immediately started coming and then the, the news started spreading that actually it, it's it's not shooting from the community. It's it's a man and he had a rifle. And and then one of the parents came and she was just bursting into tears. My, my father-in-law was shot and his best friend was killed. And I'm like, what? And then another my other best friend came and she was just bursting. I'm like, just, you know, keep, what, what's wrong? With, you know, just relax, you know. And back then, I still didn't know what happened to Ata, and I wasn't sure what happened to my father-in-law because he was also in the prayer. And I received a phone call from one of my friends, and she said, literally, the moment I I picked up, she's like, Wallahi, he's breathing. I swear to God that he's still alive and he's still breathing. But he was shot. So I'm like, okay, I was trying to understand. Okay, so my husband is shot, but he's alive. So I immediately burst into tears and I am like, oh, thank you, God. Alhamdulillah, he's still alive. So that gave me the strength to, I don't know what, I don't know how I managed to just block the idea that he's, he's, he's injured, but he's okay. I need to now focus on what we're doing because back then the monster was still roaming around. We didn't know what to do. We called the police because also the, the, the center is called An-Nur. And it's, it's got writings in Arabic. It's known to be a Muslim child care, the only Muslim child care in Christchurch. My mother-in-law and I and all the teachers were very um, worried about the safety of the children. So we started calling the parents, if you're around, please come and pick up your children. And well, I couldn't leave the, the child care. I couldn't go and, and check for out. I couldn't go to the, I, I didn't know how bad it was until later in the day when I, when the numbers started, you know, increasing. And... So we stayed maybe till 8, 8 p.m. at night because we had still a couple of children alongside my daughter. And then when we managed to secure the last couple of kids, I took my daughter and I dropped her off to a friend's house, like they're very close family friends. And I left Aya there. I, I put her in her PJs. I packed a couple of stories. I'm like, I, I have to go and, you know, like, I need to know what's happening. On the other side of the world in Bangladesh... Neha had just heard the news of a mass shooting in Christchurch. Home to her husband, Umar Farooq. New Zealand at Christchurch, a mass shooting in Christchurch, a mass shooting in Bangladesh. First time I was in Bangladesh, I was in Bangladesh. First time I came to know about attack, it was evening in Bangladesh. I saw in breaking news that three Bangladeshi's bodies had been recovered and two people are injured. New Zealand er Christ Church e Moshida Hambar por theke nikhoj thaka Naran Ganjer Omar Farooq mara gechen bole janiyechen tar poribar 
মৃত্যু সংবাদটি জানার পর পরিবার ওই এলাকায় When I spoke to him in the morning, he was at work, and I didn't have any of his friend's contact details in New Zealand. At first, the focus of the Bangladesh news was on their cricket team, who narrowly escaped the gunman by arriving to Friday prayers a few minutes late. The team was warned by a woman outside the masjid that there was a gunman inside, so they took cover in their bus. বাতিল করা হয়েছে ক্রাইস্ট চার্চে বাংলাদেশ নিউজিল্যান্ড তৃতীয় টেস্ট দেশে ফেরার অপেক্ষায় রয়েছে বাংলাদেশ দল দেন বাই নাইট টাইম ওয়েন এভরি ওয়ান ইন মাই ফ্যামিলি ওয়েন টু ব্যাড ওর ওয়েন টু দেয়ার রেসপেক্টিভ হোমস আই ওয়াজ থিঙ্কিং দ্যাট আই এম নট হিয়ারিং এনি নিউজ অ্যাবাউট মাই হাজব্যান্ড দ্য নেক্সট ডে মাই কাজেন্স কন্ট্যাক্টেড দ্য নিউজিল্যান্ড এম্বেসি দে টোল্ড মি দ্যাট ফারুক ইজ ইনজার্ড ইজ ওকে He can't call you because his hand is injured. Then I thought at least he is alive. So I was at peace. Next morning when I woke up, I asked my brother two, three times, Have you heard about Farooq? Then he said, Don't get shocked. Farooq is not alive. Farooq is dead. Then I saw in the news, that they were showing Farooq's photo, that he is dead. I couldn't believe it. How could it happen? Hamima Tuyan was also overseas on March 15th. I was in Singapore that Friday. The first thing that appeared on my Facebook f- news feed was the heading for a news article about an incident near Hagley Park in Christchurch with the picture of unknown mosque, our mosque. I soon found out that a man had entered the mosque and shot at the congregation during the time of Friday prayers. So I called my husband many times on his phone. I called friends. No one answered my calls. I finally called my husband's workplace and was told that he had not returned to the office. It was already about 3.30 p.m. at that time in Christchurch, so that call confirmed it for me that my husband was at the mosque that day. What happened next was what felt like a million bees swarming around my brain. I was reading about the death toll, um, the injuries and the, the numbers of the injured. I, I just wanted to know what happened to my husband. If anyone had seen him, did he make it past the wall? Was he safe within the cordon area? Was he one of those injured? Was he one of those under the piles of body? The gunman was wearing a video recorder which live-streamed the entire bloody scene. The government swung into action to try to shut it down, but for Hamima, it was a lifeline. When I read about the video, I started frantically looking for it. I, I just had to see it for, see it for myself. And then when I thought I had found the video, this one stopped at the part when the, the man entered the masjid door. So that was extremely frustrating for me, not being able to locate him. A few hours later, in my, during my afternoon, a doctor friend who works at the Christchurch Hospital called to inform me that my husband was in the operating theatre and that they wanted me to get there as soon as possible. The earliest flight available that day was only at 11.55 p.m. at night. But by the will of God, at 4.30 p.m., exactly three seats had become available 
on an earlier 7.55 p.m. flight, which could get me to Christchurch by 10 a.m. on the 16th of March. While Hamima is getting ready to leave Singapore to fly to Christchurch, Farah finally gets to the hospital, a few hours after her husband Atta went missing. And then the stories started coming. We saw him, he's like, in the theater doing a surgery he's he's in the, like okay he might be in Oakland he might be in Wellington and during that time his friends from Oakland started texting me are you guys okay is Atta okay is your father I'm like yeah I know that he was shot and and that he's in the surgery but I'm not sure if he's in Christchurch I don't know so one of his friends is a doctor and he um he plays um futsal with him um he told my his friend he told Atta's friend that no one is in Oakland and no one is in Wellington and all, everyone is in Christchurch. And then we, I realized that I'm not sure, you know, like there's so many different scenarios and different stories about my husband. So when I went there and I, there were a lot of men obviously there and I'm like, I know the people. I'm like, Atta's friends. I'm like, have you seen Atta? Have you heard about Atta? I'm like, he's all right. Don't worry. He'll be okay. He's okay. I'm like, okay. But it wasn't okay. News was coming in from hundreds of different directions. Even Farah's mum back in Jordan had sent some news she'd heard about his injuries. It was chaotic. And none of the news led to any real answers for Farah. Finally, a man that she'd hoped had news about her husband said that he hadn't seen Atta at all. And then that was the point where I lost hope that there was something wrong. But I just prayed that the 18, there were 18 people unrecognized, and I thought maybe, what the, from the injured, maybe out was one of them, but I still didn't know. It was the middle of the night at Christchurch Hospital. And I was so tired, we were all so tired because it was such a long day, to the point where at some point we just, you know, like, we slept on the ground for some time. Like, not slept, but just, you know, like, I just laid down, it was just so chaotic, everyone's crying, and the faces, and you know, like... <clears throat> Some deaths were confirmed and and I was hopeful until I started hearing that they're 40, they're 50 and I'm like, how could he escape? This is, this is so much, there, there's so many people, I don't, I don't know. I just had the hope and I was holding on it, but I didn't know. And so later that night, um, Dr. Fadl, who is, uh, doc- he's a doctor, and he's also our family friend that I kept my daughter at their place. He knew most of the people of the community, and he was a doctor, so he had the access. So he helped um, recognizing a lot of the, I think, the injured people back then. And then he stood on the chair in the middle, like, I think it was 1 a.m., probably, Saturday morning, and he started reading the names, and he said, "These, uh, I'm going to read the names of the people in the hospital. And back then, and I think everyone, if you, if you haven't heard the name, then they could probably be in the masjid, one of the martyrs. So he kept reading the names and the list kept going on and on and on and on. And I could see the frustration in my sister-in-law's face. And I'm just like, I felt like I had just, no, I don't know. I just felt, you know, numb. Exactly. I'm just like listening. And, and then the moment the list finished, I could see all of his friends crying and like loudly all the guys and they came to me and started giving me condolences and I'm like no don't give me condolences it's not confirmed no don't say that like it's okay for I keep state like don't say that you know and I went back that day I went back home and I just I just tried to sleep and and hope you know that maybe tomorrow we're gonna hear something you know so all of Saturday, I didn't go to the hospital. I stayed with Aya, and I waited and waited and waited. In Bangladesh, Umar Farooq's death was confirmed to his young wife Niha. Then, the media came in close. The reporters, lots of them, they came to my house in the middle of the night. They were making so much noise at my mother-in-law's house that we had to close the gate. Because I was not in a condition, you understand, that I couldn't even talk to them. I was answering the people's questions. So many people were asking questions, 
All the reporters were coming to my place only, as I was the only family member in Bangladesh out of three Bangladeshis who had died. Three Bangladeshis' bodies were coming home. I was waiting for his body to come. I will believe he's gone only when I see his body with my own eyes. I was asking my friends, have you seen him? Have you seen his picture? They sent me a picture of him from here. And then they asked me, do you believe it now? By Sunday, two days after the attacks, it had become clear to Farah that her husband was still missing, presumed dead. Her mother-in-law, Atta's mum, asked her to come see her on Sunday morning. So I went to that room and, and Khalta was crying and the moment I entered she said, Ahlan fi mart shahid Come here, uh, the wife of the martyr. And when she said that, I just fell on my knees and I'm like, I started crying. And the moment, I, I just immediately thought, what am I going to do with Aya? How am I going to raise her alone now? Because we had all these dreams and all the aspirations and, and you know, like we had planned everything. Like, how am I going to live without him? <laughs> Ayah, you know, like we were supposed to do it together. And then, yeah, I just, I thought like, I don't know how I'm, yeah, we just didn't know, just quiet and quiet. Niha, who had been planning to join her husband in New Zealand, once her immigration visa came through, decided to travel to New Zealand from Bangladesh. By this stage, she was starting to feel the symptoms of her early pregnancy. The government over here announced that one person of each family can come and take the body home. My friends over here told me that you are going to get visitor's visa. If you go with the body to Bangladesh, you can never come back. So it's better that we send the body first, then you come. There are lots of things to wind up in New Zealand for Farooq. His banking work, his own possessions had to be sorted out. In New Zealand, Farah was starting to come to terms with her husband's death in a spiritual way. The fact that we believe in afterlife, in, in the Day of Judgment, it's where Allah promises you with the ultimate happiness and, and where no tears, no pain, no tests. It's where you're going to receive the fruit of your patience, the result of whatever you, choices you decide to choose in this life. For me, the fact that Atta and the rest of the, the, the people on that day were killed on a Friday, whereas a very, it is a very special day for Muslims, so the fact that he was killed on a special day, on prayer, he had wudu, he was pure and, and clean, it gave me the confirmation that inshallah he's in a better place because we believe that martyrs are different. Because I've seen a lot of dead people and I didn't feel that sense of peace till the day I saw Atta. And that was on Thursday night. So I found out on Sunday, but I just kept waiting and waiting and waiting to see him. And, and I only saw him on Thursday. During that time, my parents came from Jordan and a lot of Atta's family, like extended family, like his uncles and, and aunties, they came from the States, from Kuwait, from Jordan. So we went to see him on Thursday and he was just sleeping. And I've seen my grandparents, the four of them, and they were all good people, pious people, worshipped Allah, and they were beautiful when they were dead. But they were cold and they were stiff. And I touched them and I kissed them. And when I kissed Atta, he was just sleeping and his lips were red and he had very soft skin. And I couldn't believe it, even if someone told me that he was, you know, he, he stayed in the masjid for how many days and he wasn't even in a fridge. Like, I just, you know, he, he just, I just felt he was closing his eyes. So also after I saw him, that even gave me more peace that he's not dead. You know, and, and there is a verse in the Quran, وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ الَّذِينَ قُتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أَمْوَاتًا بَلْ أَحْيَاءً عَنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ يُرْزَقُونَ 
And there's another verse, أَحْيَاءٌ وَلَكِنْ لَا تَشْعُرُونَ that They're not dead, the ones who were killed in the sake of Allah. They're alive, but you don't feel it. And the more I read about martyrdom in Islam, and the more I read about people, and how like if they were killed in the sake of Allah, I just felt even better and better. Although it kills me, and I'm, like, I'm in so much pain, and I just miss him so much, and I just wish I could hear his voice again, or just hug him one more time. But again, I don't want to love him in a selfish way where I wish that I wish this didn't happen to him because at the end of the day this is what we all aim for to be you know to meet Allah when he's happy and and to do our message in this world and I feel that my husband did he was very successful he was very loved this might be quite a strange concept for non-muslim listeners we aspire to be like them because we believe those 51 people who died in these tragedies they were chosen to be in Jannah, which is the eternal place, heaven. And they're very special. For the rest of us, we are still going through the tribulation of life, the challenges. And we still are trying our best to sort of pass our examinations so that we can gain our PhD, so to speak. I was in the mosque on that specific day. I was two or three meters away from the gunman, just divided by a wall. One of the questions I asked myself was, why was I not chosen on that day to be a martyr? Because a lot of people wants to be chosen. I had to contemplate and reflect. For me, I felt that I still have, <laughs> I still have to be here because there are things to be done. For a lot of people who have lost their loved ones, especially Farah, if she's happy for Atta, the most painful thing for them is the loss of the companionship of their loved ones. And here's Niha's take on it. Her words are again translated from Urdu. There are two things I'm feeling. When I look at Noor, emotionally, then I feel like crying. I ask, why has Allah taken him away? What sin had I commenced? Or what blunder had someone done that we are getting punished for? The second thing is that people talk a lot in Bangladesh. A lot of questions. Sometimes they ask very upsetting questions. Sometimes I would rather die than answer their questions. Here in New Zealand, I'm living in peace. Not so many questions. But when I'm alone, I sometimes think about Farooq, and then I get angry at Allah. But what about the gunman? The man took two semi-automatic rifles into Al Nur Mosque that Friday afternoon. After six minutes, over 40 people were dead, and even more were injured. He then drove to Linwood Masjid to do it all over again. All the mosques were full. It was Friday afternoon, a day of prayer. It seems so planned, so calculated, an act of hate. Do the widows get angry at him? To be honest, I just don't think about the monster at all. And I try not to think about him at all. Yeah, because it happened because of him. He did that. But I do believe that it's part of Allah's plan. And if Allah did not want this to happen, it wouldn't have happened. It's just part of the plan, as Mm -hmm. painful as it might feel at the Mm -hmm. moment. And the fact that I'm not the only one, I'm actually part of, a lot of widows and mothers and sisters and daughters and you know it make it also gives you strength that you're not the only one going through this here's hamima i don't want to let this man's evil and his hate or the evil and hate of those who support him consume me we can see the rise of extremists globally with the sweden democrats le pen brexit and trump But we haven't really confronted the problem and what fuels these movements. My thoughts have shifted and my focus is now on what I could do to contribute to changing mindsets. 
Farah's mum came from Jordan to spend several months supporting her daughter in New Zealand. It's nearly time for her to return home and Farah is thinking about going with her. But she has mixed feelings about returning home to Jordan right now. At the beginning I was so scared of going there because I didn't want to face it and relive it again. Because I'm going to see my friends, my families and they're all going to come. And and before, like whenever I would come they would hug me and cry because they've missed me. But now it's it's different. I'm going to, you know, like... I'm coming with so much pain. So I'm I'm part of me is really looking forward to seeing all of them and just, you know, being around them and see all the faces that I miss. But again, I'm just scared and I don't know. <laughs> As the cherry blossoms bloom in the Christchurch spring, there are a lot of decisions for our four widows to make. Will Fada decide to visit her family in Jordan as she and her daughter come to terms with Atta's absence? Can Mahubba find a way to talk about the tragedy? Will 21-year-old Niha and her newborn baby be granted permission to stay in New Zealand, living out her husband's dream of raising his daughter here? Thanks for walking alongside four of the widows in the second of eight episodes of Widows of Shuhada. I'm Asha Abdi. Assalamu alaikum. This series was produced by Community Access Radio Plains FM for RNZ, made possible by the RNZ New Zealand Oni Innovation Fund. Noon! Hey, noon! Do you want to see the crew? Farah, Niha, Mohobbo and Hamima, thank you so much for sharing your stories and for letting us walk alongside you for a little while. Barakallahu fikum. Nana Hart wrote and produced this podcast series with support from Nikki Rees, Jemaya Jones, Asma Azad and me, Asha Abdi, and a very big helping hand from the RNZ podcast team, Liz Garten and Justin Gregory had a lot to do with this episode. To Tim Watkin and Senior Commissioner Kay Almas, Jazakallahu khair. Thank you, and may Allah bring you goodness. Lots of others mucked in, including Bryony Lustavika, Alex Hama, our caring translators Ali Mohammed and Alka Srivanasan, and the entire team at Plains FM. There are some touching photos by the talented Janeth Gilk. Check them out on the RNZ website. The beautiful music is from Hasim Shaheen, an Egyptian oud player, and Liam Oliver from Christchurch. You can find Widows of Shuhada podcast on rnz.co.nz, plainsfm.org.nz, or any podcatcher, including Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Podbean, and Google Podcasts. Please subscribe and rate us. And to the 51 who were lost that day, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. We came from Allah, and to Allah we shall return. <laughs>